Hello, and welcome to Our Future in Space. Can we get to Mars in less than 100 days? It normally takes six to eight months to reach the red planet, but today we're going to be talking with Dr. Andy Aldrin of Emory-Riddle University and Dr. Brian Kaplinger of the University of Kansas to find out more. I'm Jeff Greenblatt, the Vice President of Science and Research. And I'm Eric Ward, the Vice President of Engineering Design at Orbital Assembly. Thanks for joining us. We hope you enjoy this episode. Our Future in Space, brought to you by Orbital Assembly, with your hosts, Dr. Jeff Greenblatt and Eric Ward. And today, I am joined by my co-host, Dr. Tom Spilker, who is the Chief Technical Officer at Orbital Assembly. How's it going, Tom? Uh, going quite well. Thank you. Thanks for being here today. Yeah, I invited Tom because of his extensive background in uh, orbital dynamics and, and many other areas. And uh, it's because we're going to be talking about a fairly technical topic today. I'm joined by two, two experts on the uh, topic of Mars cyclers, Dr. Uh, Andrew Aldrin, as well as Professor, uh, or Professor Aldrin, as well as Professor Brian Kaplinger. And um, welcome, gentlemen. It's Thanks great to be here. here. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, let me give a little background for our listeners on, on both of you. I'll start with uh, Professor Aldrin, uh, who has been a guest on our show before. Um, Dr. Aldrin is president of the Aldrin Family Foundation, an organization dedicated to harnessing the inspiration of space. Dr. Aldrin is also the program chair and founder of the Master of Science Operations Program at Embry-Riddle University. Before moving into academia, he had a distinguished career in industry and government research, including executive positions at Boeing, United Launch Alliance, and Moon Express. He serves on the board of several charitable organizations, including the Secure World Foundation, Sea Space Symposium, Space for Humanity, and the Tau Zero Foundation. Aldrin's father, Buzz, walked on the moon with Neil Armstrong. Uh, professor Kaplinger is an assistant professor in aerospace engineering at the University of Kansas. And his research interests include astrodynamics, trajectory and mission design, and vision-based spacecraft guidance, navigation, and control. So uh, we invited Dr. Kaplinger here today because he's collaborated with both uh, uh, Professor Aldrin as well as Buzz Aldrin on a number of research projects exploring Mars cyclers, which we'll get into <clears throat> in much more detail in a moment. So thank you once again, uh, both of you, for, for being here and being willing to talk about this really interesting topic. Um, Tom, why don't you uh, uh, kick things off? If you'd like to start with a question. Okay, uh, starting out with the basics, uh, why would you do a cycler rather than just every time you want to go Mars to Mars or come back from Mars, just have a spacecraft built for just that one trip? Why would a cycler give you any advantage? Uh, so, Tom, let me just jump in first and just give you a little bit of history, and then we'll talk about what the advantages are of cyclers. So, um, you know, it, it actually goes back to a conversation my dad had with Tom Payne. This goes shortly, I think it was actually shortly after um, Tom retired. I, mean, I think my dad had retired and moved to California. And um, somehow or another in the course of a conversation with Tom Payne, who of course was previously the administrator of NASA, um, this, the topic of well, why don't you, why don't you think about doing a, something that would just cycle between the earth and moon? And my dad thought about it anyway, because my dad was trained as an astrodynamicist. That's, yes. that's really why he got into the program. And so he said, yeah, we could do that. And so he fooled around with it for a while. Um, lots of sketches and lots of trying to make me understand. And I kept saying, dad, I don't get it. You know, you, you can get there in three days. It's easy. Why, why do you want to cycle? <laughs> and so, he came to that conclusion through his own logic, had nothing to do with anything I told him. Um, and then he just kind of transitioned to Mars. And so he started thinking about cyclers to Mars. And so um, there's kind of two versions of why. There's the version that let's say I would suggest, and, and I think Brian would probably agree is, Cyclers are incredibly efficient ways of getting people to Mars in a very large protected environment. Because once you accelerate it to, a, depending on the kind of the, the exact trajectory you use, and we'll look at that, um, 
you can essentially have a ballistic trajectory that requires, in theory, very little to no delta V. And so once you accelerate this huge mass that's got your Eclis systems, has um, shielding, anything else, all of the really massive things you need to have a nice habitable space for going to Mars, um, you only accelerate that once. And then all you need to do is take a very small spacecraft and accelerate that to um, to meet with the cycler and then to part the cycler. And so it gets a very efficient way of going there, but it's probably not something you invest in until you have um, a regularized program to go to Mars. Now, my dad's vision of it was you start with cyclers and you never stop using cyclers, but that's, uh, so I think, you know, even Elon Musk liked the idea of, uh, thought the idea of cyclers was an interesting thing, but he chose not to do it at any rate. So Brian, I'll let you take it from there and kind of get into more of the technical details of it. Orbital Assembly is leading the way in the development of artificial gravity stations so people can live, work, and thrive in space. OAC's platforms are market category creators. They are backwards compatible with current standards, allowing for you to move from concept to production at the pace of business. To learn more, visit orbitalassembly.com. Yeah, so when NASA has been looking at going to the moon again and Mars and beyond, one of the key drivers of that is understanding the process of what happens with humans in long-term spaceflight. And a lot of the research that's been done in extended stays on the International Space Station and other places has shown that the human body does not tolerate long-term spaceflight extremely well without good preparation. And so things like uh, microgravity can have extreme uh, effects on the body, things like uh, long-term duration without, uh, as Professor Aldrin mentioned, shielding um, from radiation and other effects on the body um, can have, you know, the effects that we expect to see of radiation, but also effects on the brain and the eyes and other sensitive parts of the body. Uh, and so really the way to solve that is to have sort of a high mass vehicle. Now, the vehicles that we've looked at for transporting humans to the moon and Mars and beyond uh, so far, you know, they're operating within very constrained regimes of what we can have in terms of mass and volume and, and things like that. Now, going way back into the 60s and 70s, there's been a lot of studying of, you know, physiologically and psychologically, you know, what humans would expect uh, for the amount of volume in order to be productive over an extended mission length, which we might see going to Mars, um, missions on the orders of, you know, three months to a year um, in deep space and potentially two or three years, you know, from leaving Earth to arriving back home. Um, and so in that first 30 days, you know, when they study the amount of volume that humans sort of need to have per person, it goes up by a factor of five. So as you're uh, moving beyond the moon and you're moving to Mars or other destinations, uh, if you're spending more than a month in space, you need a lot more volume. And that just yes. takes a more massive spacecraft. And so the very first humans that go to Mars probably are not going to go on a cycler. But as we have an extended human presence there, we're going to need to bring more humans to our scientific outposts or to our stations, colonies, whatever uh, you want to envision there. And we're going to have to bring people home. And the cycler concept is one of the most efficient ways of doing that on a per capita basis. So for every astronaut that we want to deliver and every astronaut that we want to take home, uh, cyclers present one of the alternatives that can give us a cheap per astronaut marginal cost. So it takes a lot of money, time, and effort to put it on the trajectory uh, that does that cycling uh, or repeated interactions between Earth and Mars. But then once you put it there, you only have to do a little bit of adjustment. Um, and so if you're going to have a lot of humans transferring back and forth, um, it appears to us at least that that's one of the most uh, efficient ways that we could transport that amount of people back and forth. Right. And hence our interest in learning more about this. Um, but Tom, sorry, did you want to jump in with a follow-up question or? Well, uh, just a, an observation, uh, Professor Aldrin noted that uh, you have this fairly high mass cycler going between Earth and Mars, and all you have to do is uh, have a transfer vehicle that you leave Earth and it rendezvous with the cycler, and that can be a, a, a fairly low mass vehicle to do that. Uh, as it turns out, uh, 
most of the mass that that vehicle has to carry is not the humans. It's all of the stuff to sustain those humans for the, the duration of the flight. So there are a lot of consumables and so on that uh, need to be done. And uh, I'm, I'm not familiar with exactly what that factor is for, for every kilogram of human, how much uh, uh, infrastructure materials like water and food and so on do you have to bring for say a, a, a one, one synodic period mission? Well, the point is really not... that, you know, you wanna get yourself out of that box where every gram of sustainment equipment, whether it's shielding um, for cosmic, um, galactic cosmic rays, or it's um, water, or it's greenhouses to grow your own food. Um, if you can sort of get out of that calculation, and that becomes essentially the non-recurring cost. But as what Brian was spot on, what he said, what, what this is really about is reducing the marginal cost of sending an astronaut to Mars, because that's the killer, and that's the killer in space. Fixed cost and are just the killer of, of space programs. And if you have essentially a lower fixed cost to keep a, a, a let's say five years, or excuse me, five crew, 10 crew, every synodic period, um, and you can do that for one tenth the cost, that's a, sustain, a, a sustainable yeah. program. Because that's huge. You know, we, we, know what, we know what our budget is gonna be. I mean, NASA's, uh, NASA's human space flight budget is pretty consistent over time. And so you got to fit in that box, and this is a way of fitting within that box. You're going to have to, uh, you're going to have to bite off a huge non-recurring cost to get started. Right. But you know, it's, you know, we can get into the sort of economics of space maybe on another uh, on another program. But uh, that's this is, I think, um, it absolutely must be part of the discussion about permanent presence on Mars. It absolutely must be. And, and, I, and I don't think there's any question that it will be. Yeah, to, to follow up a little bit on Dr. Aldrin's discussion of, of non-recurring costs, um, when we're sending a bunch of humans to Mars and establishing a sustainable uh, long-term presence, you know, there's a lot of, you know, if we think of everything in terms of mass, I mean, to me, mass is easier than dollars, right? So as you mentioned, we've got equipment uh, to feed people, right? So that's just a need. That's a, a requirement that has to be met. Uh, we have a requirement that we're going to have to have water. We're going to have to have fuel. We're going to have to have oxygen to breathe. And so if you start adding all of these things up and tallying the list, you end up with a lot of mass that's needed to support humans on yes. Mars. Now, as we move into the future, we're going to have lots of alternatives and options for uh, answering those check uh, marks on the list, right? So as we develop uh, in-situ resource utilization, or ISRU, we're going to have the ability, as Dr. Aldrin mentions, to potentially grow food on Mars um, like we've done on the International Space Station and are studying how to do in deep space. Um, we're going to potentially be able to extract oxygen from the atmosphere like the MOXIE experiment uh, is demonstrating for gases uh, in uh, the atmosphere of Mars. We're potentially going to be able to extract methane or uh, other types of fuels from the surface or the atmosphere um, or we could extract many uh, materials from the lunar surface and ship them. And so throughout the solar system, we can build the types of infrastructure that's needed. But right. what we can't do is we can't stop the mass that's going to cost us that's potentially disposable. So things that are going to get used every time and they get burnt up. Um, you know, heat shields might be one of those, although there have been, uh, you know, research into uh, reusable TPS or thermal protective systems. Um, so that's just an example. There, there are things that are going to get used up every mission um, or stressed too hard, and we're not going to want to reuse them in the same configuration. They're going to need significant servicing or repair. And that's what we're looking at is what type of long-term infrastructure supports a low disposable mass um, mm -hmm. for each batch of, of astronauts that you want to take to or from Mars. So, I mean, there's I was... go ahead, Tom. Yeah, I was eventually going to go there, but uh, you beat me to it. Uh, you mentioned sustainability. And uh, one of the things that I could env envision, and you wouldn't start this way. You'd start by carrying up, if you're going from Earth to Mars, all of the water and food that the astronauts would need uh, during that transfer to Mars. You'd need to carry that up with you on the transfer vehicle. 
but eventually if you build a cycler such that it reuses everything like water the the uh, things that people are breathing out, including water, using the carbon dioxide and reducing it back to other forms of carbon that uh, are useful. Growing your own food, uh, whether it's it's by uh, uh, hydroponics or something like that, or even 3D printing food and uh, generating proteins by chemical means rather than having animals. Having a sustainable system on board eventually would mean that the transfer vehicles have to carry quite a bit less mass uh, back and forth. And that means that those will be smaller and more, more uh, cost effective uh, transfer vehicles. Yeah. Right. And, and I was just going to add, and that also means that if you're doing all this on board your cycler spacecraft, I'm presumably the mass of that might have to grow to accommodate things like a regenerative, you know, life support system or, or, you know, essentially, uh, a, uh, a farm, right? A small farm yeah. in space. So a couple of things. One is um, it, it's almost Mars Habitation 1.0 and Mars Habitation 2.0. So 1.0 is backpacking. We carry everything with us and it's really, yeah. really inefficient. And I don't care what kind of propulsion you've got, but it, I mean, even you know, nuclear thermal, nuclear electric doesn't change that fundamental problem. Um, what I would suggest is I don't know if it's 2.0 and there's a 3.0, but at some point um, you have to build the infrastructure on Mars to sustain yourself at a minimum um, mm. cost of cargo. Because cargo, cargo is not gonna go on a cycler. There's no real advantage to taking a, a kilogram of whatever it is on a cycler because you still right. have to accelerate and decelerate that kilogram. So you're gonna right. do it other ways. And, and and so you've got to be able to use the land for everything that Brian said we might do. We have to be able to do. We have to be able to live on Mars. I mean, right now, it's roughly a billion dollars to send a ton to Mars. We know that. Hmm. We have yeah. no idea what it costs. To, it's going to be, imagine what it costs to bring it back. Um, yeah. So at any rate, we simply have to do that, but we will figure that out. It can't. If you, if you basically say we're not going to Mars until we have a complete ISRU system and everything else there that's functioning, you'll never go. So we've got to get started going there. Then we figure out how to um, live off of the land. And then you can start talking about cyclers. And to the second point is um, depending on the configuration, some cycler configurations actually have this kind of because they're literally infinite ways of doing a cycle. But you, you actually can have a pass by Earth where it would be your sort of refurb pass. And you would and it would be a somewhat shorter cycle to the time, but you'd have an opportunity to, to refit the cycler with things. Or you can just do it when you send it, when, when um, you know, you can do your mods to the cycler, but you really want to, you kind of want to do those things separately and you'd like to get as much of the cycler the first time out because when you spin it out right it's going to take years to actually get it to its trajectory you're going to do a bunch of gravity assists and all that kind of stuff um you only want to do that once mm -hmm. and so um there are things that we can do to think through the cargo side of it but there are a lot of interesting opportunities so it's a really really rich topic then you almost get into mars 3.0 where you're getting all of your cargo, all of your mass as much as possible from the moon, right? Because uh -huh. we have been trying since the beginning of time, in space at least, to solve the problem of launching off of the Earth. And, and I don't care about what kind of rocket you're talking about. You get the rockets for free and you still got to pay. You can only cut your costs by 50% because you've still got, I mean, SpaceX has 10,000 people, still got to pay for them. The way we will solve the problem of launching off of the Earth is launching off of the moon. I mean, there's so many different things about launching off the moon. If you can figure it out, that just will, will change everything. You don't need fairings. You can literally launch, um, in theory, any kind of structure you wanted with the right kind of propulsion system, as long as you can kind of keep the G loads low enough and that sort of stuff. Or you can just throw your stuff into space and build it in space using additive manufacturing externally, right? And so 
that's kind of the long-term future and side players are in there somewhere. Um, I, I'm probably not going to expect an RFP coming out of NASA next week. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fine. Um, Andy, you bring up some really great points, including sort of lunar manufacturing, but I want to get back to sort of the at orbital dynamics of the cyclers itself, because I realize we've kind of skipped over that. But before we do, I just need to take a short break. Uh, to, that's because that's there's to... only one person on here who really knows what they're talking about. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So we'll give you the floor in a second, Brian. Hang tight. Here we go. Ideas are powerful things. Ideas drive us to broaden our minds and help us seek truth about the universe around us. We are rogue space systems. Ideas above. Okay, so Brian, yeah, I think you you have a little uh, background to provide to our, our listeners. Uh, maybe starting with the like, what's the, what was the original idea of of a of a Mars cycler, and then how has that idea evolved over the intervening years? And by the way, who actually first came up with the who had the first concept of of a Mars cycler? Was it Buzz Aldrin or was it somebody else? Honestly, I don't know the answer to that um, in terms of who was the first person to have the idea. I think that uh, Buzz, uh, the elder of the Dr. Aldrins, was one of the first people to popularize the concept for sure. Uh, mm-hmm. And definitely to, uh, you know, make his idea for a cycler well known. Um, and that particular idea um, is now known as the Aldrin cycler. And so the Aldrin cycler um, is an Earth-Mars cycler orbit. So um, as Dr. Aldrin mentioned previously, Um, you know, the very first missions to Mars are going to be bringing all of our own mass. Uh, And so as we do that, you know, uh, we're going to do that for, you know, the way any engineer would do it for risk reduction, right, to make sure we know and understand everything that we're doing. But as we build up that presence, um, we're going to need to have mass that's sort of pre-positioned for us. And one of the places to do that is in an orbit that is going to repeatedly interact with Earth and Mars. And so these are orbital paths that we've come to know as cyclers uh, because they'll mm-hmm. cycle back and forth uh, in a way that's very similar to like a bus that's making stops between the same stops back and forth. Um, or another analogy that's been used is as a cruise ship that uh, stops by the ports. Um, and in some cases, if the port's too small, you know, you would get on a, a smaller vehicle to go back and forth. Um, between this large cruise ship or warship that's parked off the shore. So um, that's sort of the analogy here where our big mass vehicle is not going to be something we're going to slow down at Mars. Um, And so it's relatively insensitive to how much mass we have in place there. Uh, Now to find these orbits, we have to find things that repeat uh, or are periodic with periods that are the same as the relative positioning between Earth and Mars. So uh, about every two and one seventh years, Uh, Mars and Earth are going to repeat their same geometric configuration, more or less, uh, if you treat them as being in the same plane. And so that's called the synodic period. Uh, So the Earth-Mars synodic period is going to roughly reset the geometry um, between where they're initially located. And so that's why things, uh, missions to Mars, we see happen approximately every two years, uh, where we have, you know, uh, Mars 2020 uh, or Curiosity and then Insight before that in 2018 uh, or uh, 2016 would, uh, would have been Curiosity so every two years um, and so when we have uh, the Perseverance was would have been uh, Mars 2020 and so every two years sort of we have these opportunities to go to Mars so that minimum energy uh, time frame is the Hohmann transfer so it's the smallest elliptical orbit that will connect uh, Earth and Mars in the solar system And so, again, that geometry repeats with the synodic period. Uh, And so the Aldrin cycler was an orbit that would pass by Mars, but not necessarily then slow down uh, or minimally go past. So that had been developed initially uh, to go around the moon uh, uh, with some of Buzz's theories, as Andy mentioned. Um, And then uh, the Aldrin cycler, as it's come to be known, uh, was a transit to Mars. Now, one of the challenges with that was that when it came back to Earth, uh, the amount of turning that had to happen in the orbit with the uh, gravitational assist to Earth uh, is just too much for the actual Earth to accomplish, even though it sort of works out on paper. Um, and so then there started to be more looking at lunar cyclers, which is what you're seeing there um, with Anthony Genova out of uh, NASA Ames, uh, a paper that he had done with uh, Buzz Aldrin in 2015. Um, and so that same orbit is shown uh, on the bottom right there, I guess you're seeing uh, mm-hmm. in a uh, Earth-Moon 
rotating frames, you can see that those two objects are sort of static in that image. And, you know, you get these really interesting pictures. If, if you go to what I think was the next frame uh, in your deck there that had the pictures mm -hmm. of the flowers. Um, yes. What you get is even though as we're having gravitational assist, so this is actually the Earth Moon system. Um, but as you have these repeated interactions with a smaller body, in this case, the moon, you're turning the orbit a little bit. And eventually you turn the orbit until the whole thing kind of repeats. Um, and so uh, there's a lot of interesting uh, theories on this. You know, we can even switch between different cyclers. Uh, as you can see, that orbit kind of changes, gets smaller and bigger uh, a little bit. And we can do the same thing with Earth and Mars. So in this case, that smaller body um, being Mars in the solar system, we would have an orbit about the sun. Um, and we can trim our orbit using gravitational assists at Earth and Mars. Uh, and so there's several different uh, types of ways of doing this. Um, but essentially, the, the main theme is that we're using gravitational assist at Earth, and in some cases, Mars, uh, to rotate that orbit a little bit so that that geometry can repeat approximately every two years. Uh, and so a lot of the work is done by gravity um, rather than by trying to push this massive vehicle around. Hmm. Okay. So essentially, whoops, let me take this off, um, unless you wanted to show another diagram. Uh, my question is, so an ideal cycler, once it's accelerated onto the trajectory, it can do everything using gravitational assist and would need no fuel whatsoever. But of course, in the real world, that's never the case, right? What, what kind of propellant requirements do we end up needing for some of these uh, cycler orbits that you've, that you've looked at or just walk so us through the basic idea? The traditional way of looking at a cycler, yes, is that it's a ballistic orbit. Ballistic means once we put it on that path, it's going to stay on that path uh, in this deterministic fashion where we can predict wherever it is in the future. Now, we know the real world doesn't work like that. And so any type of system that we put onto a cycler type path is going to need some kind of propulsion to tweak itself and to really uh, target those gravity assists and to make sure that they're going to work very well. And we, and we know how to do this with spacecraft. Uh, the Cassini spacecraft did well over 100 gravity assists at Titan and several other moons in the Saturnian system, as well as the gravity assists it did um, on the interplanetary trajectory. And so just that one vehicle, you know, really worked like a, a well-oiled machine in terms of lining up a gravity assist, doing the gravity assist, trimming up a little bit with propulsion afterward, uh, and then just do this repeating cycle of targeting the next thing down the road. And that's the way that we would envision a cycler system working is that every mm -hmm. incoming interaction with Earth or Mars, we would be targeting that interaction, we would execute that interaction and then trim it up after the fact. Um, and so the traditional way of looking at a cycler, we would just have you know a non-deterministic uh, amount of impulse that's required or fuel that's required, um, which means we can't really predict it um, from first principles, just by looking at the shape of the orbit, we have to simulate mm -hmm. uh, what happens if we go off the orbit a little bit, how do we correct it? And so we can look at various options for cycler orbits by that stability of the orbit. So how much fuel does it cost if we were to drift away from it a little bit? And what we're interested in are stable cycler orbits in which very little fuel is needed to accommodate that. And uh, our cutoff arbitrarily has been approximately a kilometer uh, per second of delta V. Uh, or velocity change for every cycle. So every, uh, in this case, they were two synodic period uh, cyclers, so about every four years. So that's about 250 meters per second of changing the velocity per year. Uh, and we think that's an accomplishable goal based off of the amount of velocity change that's been done at the uh, International Space Station. Now, there are ways of accommodating that with very little fuel mass of so newer technologies uh, like electric propulsion um, uh, or other types of plasma-based propulsion can give us uh, some significant velocity change for very little change in the mass of fuel. Um, so mm -hmm. that's an efficiency standpoint. And because we're not needing a whole lot of thrust to happen all at once, we just need to nudge it here and there. Um, it seems like a technology that's very interesting for the development of cyclers. Yeah, sounds like it's well matched to the needs here because you don't have to do anything quickly. So as long as you carry enough propellant on board so that and I'm guessing that you could carry enough propellant, even for this heavy spacecraft, that you would only have to replenish that every several years, right? Or maybe even the life of the cycler, where it carries it all. Um, yeah, I mean, there's there are really infinite possibilities, but if you look at the least mm -hmm. energy, I, I, that would be sort of an S1L1, right, Brian? 
something close to uh, that? That's the baseline for a lot of a lot of people's studies right now. Yes. Okay. What you went sorry, up LMS, what does that stand for? S one oh one. Not even sure. <laughs> so just as, as a brief background, um, there was a group at, at Purdue, uh, Dr. Langusky's group, that had studied a family of different cyclers that they had done um, using uh, two different gravity assists at Earth. One to trim the orbit a little bit, and then one to reset the cycle every two and one seventh years. Um, and of this family, there are several different ones, point solutions that came out. Um, and there's one in particular that had some really interesting velocities near Earth and near Mars and, and, and you know, a moderate flight time of uh, just over 100 days. Uh, and so that one uh, came about from the solution of a, a style of problem where it did one loop around um, and it selected the short solution for that loop. And then it did another loop around um, one full loop and selected the long uh, based solution for that loop. And so that be uh, came to be known as the S1L1 type orbit for a short solution, one loop, and a long solution, one loop. And so that's just how they categorize the family. Um, gotcha. The terminology is sort of stuck. Um, and so thank you. that particular solution requires that you have one inbound cycler and one outbound cycler. It's just that there are other solutions where you can um, actually have um, a single cycler every other synodic period going out one period, skipping a period, and then coming, being a return cycler, Mars Earth. But the um, the S one L one, which is an a, a sort of a simple case, requires that you have a minimum of two cyclers. Okay, I see. Well, two's not bad if you're talking about providing continuous access every roughly two years to the. No, Mars and if Earth. you if if I were going to pick one that seemed to make sense, I would have an architecture where you would have this configuration where you've got, let's say, 100-day trip times and, and you you go out one synodic period, you skip a synodic period and come back the next. And if you've got two of these vehicles, both of which are capable of going both outbound and inbound, it's a nice architecture because if you have a failure of one vehicle, you still have another vehicle that can get you back. You may just have to cut it out on Mars for a couple of extra years, but it's it's kind of an elegant solution, and that would be kind of where um, where I would go. And I'll tell you, I'll, I'll tell you, my dad focused on the single cycler. You go out and you don't come home, and that was uh, a topic of some dinner time conversation. <laughs> uh, um, I, for now, I think we're planning on trying to bring astronauts home. <laughs> yeah, I would hope so. You know, I personally, when Kennedy gave his speech, I was mostly concerned about and bringing them safely, return them safely. Part, you know, it's uh, it, it, there is no question about it. My dad is cut from a different cloth. Well, and, and that's important as an engineer is to set your requirements. So if he hadn't said and bring them home safely, he would have been setting an entirely different set of requirements. Right. right. Yeah, I uh, just want to make a point. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Tom. Did you want to? Please. Yeah, uh, Professor Aldrin uh, mentioned the uh, architecture, uh, and there are architectures in the trajectories. There are also architectures in the hardware itself, and I think one of one of the really beneficial aspects that you could build into the architecture of the cyclers themselves is to be modular. You may start out with a hundred-ton vehicle, which of mm. course we don't have a, a launch vehicle that's going to send 100 tons to Mars with a single launch. But with, with various kind of uh, orbital dynamics, uh, uh, actual uh, or activities, uh, gravity assists, um, ion propulsion and various things, you can eventually get that 100 tons onto a, an Earth-Mars cycler trajectory. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to add a 10 ton module later on, or a couple of 10 ton modules, there are launch vehicles that can send 10 tons onto that trajectory. So on one of the earth flybys, you send a, a new module to add to the system mm -hmm. and put it onto the trajectory such that it can rendezvous. And now you've upgraded the cycler system uh, with a single launch. And by by using this modular architecture, you can start out with what you need to start with and then maybe add a farm module later on that allows you to do some of this this uh, consumables recycling and uh, 
re, uh, reduces the, the requirements on those transfer vehicles. So the, the building in of a modular architecture, I think would be a great advantage for the cycler itself. You, you could, I would still tend to want to accelerate as much of the mass as the initial mass as possible yeah. in the very efficient electric propulsion, gravity mm -hmm. assist um, mission type so that, because when you're sending the 10 tons out there to rendezvous, um, you're sending that using chemical. It has to be very high thrust propulsion, very expensive right. way to get the mass up there. Um, I mean, you could, in theory, send your modules up on essentially the same sort of um, electric propulsion trajectory that you'd use to ac accelerate the overall, um, the mothership, if you will. But it would take you years to actually get your module there. And yeah, so that's right. kind of a dream. You may want, it may be better from, from the moon, I don't know. But one of the, I, I think you're hitting on a, an, an interesting point that we just started touching on at Florida Tech, which is there are lots of elements of the architecture. Right? There's, and every mission segment has lots of interesting op options to it. So, you know, you, you essentially, you've got to get from Earth to orbit. We kind of know how to do that. You've got to get from Earth orbit to actually rendezvous with the cycler, which is a dicey proposition. So if you, and there are two ways you can do this, and this was actually kind of a, a sticking point early on with some folks at NASA, that if you rendezvous with the cycler after it passes by the Earth and it's on its way to Mars and you miss, you're going to Mars in a little spacecraft, which isn't a pleasant situation. Right. And so you don't want to do that. And so one of the things that, uh, I'm not sure we completely solved it, but along with Purdue, I think, Brian and I, I've forgotten the, the guy at Purdue actually looked at the idea of rendezvousing with the cycler as it's coming to the earth. And then your abort scenario is still not altogether pleasant, but it's a whole lot better than going to Mars. And that's just, so that's one example. Then you've got your trip to Mars on the cycler. Then you got to get off of the cycler and get to the surface of Mars. And then you've got to decide you know, do you get off of the cycler and go to Mars orbit? And there's some vehicle from Mars orbit that's taking you to the surface. And you've got the same kind of questions when you're getting off of the surface of Mars and ultimately you have to accelerate and meet the cycler. Um, and so all of these things represent a whole bunch of trade studies that we were just kind of scratching the surface on. And, and a lot of it, of course, is dependent upon your over your, your larger architecture. What's the basic mission configuration of your cyclers and those kinds of things. Super rich, um, and that's not even really getting to the whole cargo side of the equation. Because as I said, you're probably not gonna take much cargo on the cycle. You're gonna take what you need, but cargo can go there any way you want to. Mm -hmm. So yeah, as you mentioned, uh, Tom, there's some interesting ways, when you start to talk about, I have this orbit that's gonna be repeating with Earth and Mars and it becomes part of the overall picture of the architecture I'm building, you have some interesting options that come up. Um, so when you say we're going to try and build something that's that's modular, you know that's that's an awesome idea, and I think a, a modular type cycler or something that could adjust with the times or the mission uh, is definitely something that a lot of people are interested in. But the second we have something where we're adding modules or, or subtracting them and things like that, we buy ourselves a really large systems engineering problem. Um, so we got to figure out how we're going to push this thing uh, with a propulsive system. Um, and have plan ahead for that. Uh, if it's going to be in a gravity well, so uh, deep near Earth or, or Mars when we build it, uh, now we have to adjust for, you know, the types of uh, attitude control and orientation problems that we might have uh, in adjusting that. Um, but there are a lot of advantages if we can plan for some of those things ahead. So um, we have the opportunity to build large parts of the cycler um, on orbit or in other places where they're not deeply inside a gravity well or an atmosphere, um, right. uh, or we can build it, you know, on the cyclic orbit potentially if we can get most of the mass we need to start with there. So um, through uh, assembly by uh, robotic systems or uh, additive manufacturing or, or a host of, of different types of technologies, you know, there are some interesting things we could do with a spacecraft that never needs to go anywhere near a gravity well. It just has very specific requirements that it has to meet. And so if you're right. not deep near the earth 
and you're never going to be deep near Mars. You're just in the solar system. Uh, so going around the sun for the most part, um, and most of the acceleration you're going to experience has already happened. Uh, you don't have to worry a, about building to launch from the surface of the Earth. You don't have to worry about a spacecraft that's going to sit on the pad, you know, for days before it launches or sit in storage for months before it launches. So you can use exotic materials that oxygen doesn't play well with. Um, you can use configurations that don't have to sustain 1G of continuous uh, acceleration or more. Um, or the, you know, six plus Gs that you would have from a, a launch from the surface of the mm -hmm. Earth. So there's some various interesting ways that you could build up that architecture and design it um, around a spacefaring civilization. So I'm, I'm going to do something really unfair to you, Brian, but it never stopped me in the past. Does it make, <laughs> any, sense, does it make any sense to build the structures, the big heavy stuff, um, in a, in a higher energy orbit, if you will, but in other words, near the moon, it, I, somewhere in Sicily, I'll, I'll say somewhere in the sort of weak stability yeah. boundary region. Uh, potentially, yeah, or uh, at a Lagrange point. Uh, well, that's so part are, of the, the Lagrange points are in the weak stability boundary region, right? Um, without dicing uh, points, yeah, sort of. Sort of. Um, okay. Yes. I have <laughs> yes. now expended my knowledge of weak stability boundaries. <laughs> Yeah, so th there's there's regions around the Earth and the Moon where there's a lot of interactions between gravity, um, and you can kind of easily slip between realms where you might be in orbit around the Moon or you might be in orbit around the Earth, uh, and, and you have sort of hybrid orbits that rely on the gravity yeah. of both things like the uh, distant retrograde orbit that they were testing out uh, with the Artemis mission. Um, yeah. You also have uh, the near rectilineal halo orbit or NRHO uh, that is being expected for the Gateway. Uh, vehicle um, or station, and then also is being tested by, I think it's the Capstone mission right now uh, to demonstrate that is a lunar stabilized orbit in an Earth-Moon three-body okay. system. Uh, mm -hmm. And so you have lots of options where, you know, gravity is interacting uh, there. And, and two of the, the points that are, are very, uh, they're technically unstable in a mathematical sense, but we can have orbits around, or near them um, in a long-term sense. Uh, are the Lagrange points L1 and L2 uh, being close here, uh, kind of direct along the line between the Earth and the Moon, mm -hmm. uh, about 90-ish percent of the way to the Moon, um, and then on the other side, uh, about 10 percent of that distance on the other side of the Moon. And so um, those are two points, uh, for example, uh, where we can, you know, there are uh, space telescopes uh, that have looked at, at those types of uh, locations. There's been ideas of doing communication satellites and building an orbital station um, is one possibility because you have the situation where, you know, the large gravity effects sort of mutually cancel out right. um, and you're far enough away from the earth that you wouldn't get huge tidal effects on large systems that you're building. Uh -huh. so those types of tidal effects, um, honestly, are what have doomed some large assembly uh, projects. Mm -hmm. You know, in the, the 80s, they were saying, you know, the space solar panel or solar power provision was just not going to happen because of how, you know, some of these effects that that occur. And so, um, and, and you go back and forth on whether or not some things are possible with the changing in technology. Um, so yeah, you put me on the spot. But yeah, I think there are advantages. I think that, uh, like I already mentioned, there's there's chemical advantages. So you can use materials that would oxidize um, by building anything in space. Um, and by building it not deep into a gravity well, you could have some additional advantages in these sort of repeated stresses that are occurring. So if you're in low Earth orbit every 90 minutes to two hours, right. you're going to have these sort of repeated stresses that occur. And it's going to try to rotate bodies so that they're um, aligned vertically. Um, and so, you know, that, that can uh, do some damage and, and, and cause some stress on a, on a system at, while you're in the process of building it uh, that just has to be planned for ahead of time. And if you're not going to experience that, uh, during the course of normal operations, then it would be advantageous to remove that during the course of manufacturing. Well, um, and so, I mean, we're talking 30 years out in the future and, and 30 years out in the future, it's, it's not ridiculous to say we will, we will have lunar based industry. And so mm -hmm. we'll be mm -hmm. taking minerals off of the moon and perhaps sending them out into space and actually doing additive manufacturing in space. So we're going to be building stuff on the moon. And it's going to be a lot cheaper to take at least the heavy structures. There's going to be sophisticated systems, electronics, maybe a lot of the UCLA systems that 
you'll bite the bullet and send that from Earth out there. But if you're starting with this, you know, 100 ton, 500 ton um, spacecraft at, at the moon that, that may, you may just start off with some advantages getting into um, the velocities you need with the cycle orbit as well. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I think that you raise a really interesting point. I think that um, you know, we mentioned, okay, you have this that's available because of new technologies or this, that's a, that's a, you know, a new idea. Um, I think we see have a interesting possibility as you have availability, um, in particular of water ice and, and the types of things that could be occur from the lunar surface, um, might increase the use of cryogenic propellants, um, both, uh, hydrogen and liquid oxygen, as well as methane and liquid oxygen, um, type systems. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we've mentioned some of the benefits of electric propulsion systems, um, but I think that that becomes a different calculation when you have uh, chemical propulsion elements, whether it's fuel and or oxidizer that are available from a source other than the surface of the earth. And so I think there's a really interesting time that we're entering where there's going to be sort of um, a lot of mixing between different technologies being applied to problems mm -hmm. um, and the calculations we use to say which of them is going to be the better option, I think is going to get more complicated as there become um, more places to source materials and then more use points, right. be it low Earth orbit or some of these Lagrange points uh, or near the surface of the moon um, or on trips out to Mars. Uh, and so mixing and matching between different technologies mm -hmm. and different uh, types of uh, infrastructure for sourcing materials and, and fuel and, and oxidizer um, become a very interesting problem. Well, and, and probably, I mean, you're going to need a lot of water on the cycler anyway. You may use that for shielding. There may be other materials from the lunar surface that you're going to use for shielding um, that would constitute like a just rock. For instance. Maybe I, there. I, 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 um, there are obviously different materials have different degrees of. I, I'm not even sure what the right term is, but they would different materials have different degrees of effectiveness as shielding. Um, water is a good one. Um, but I think there's some other things you can do with hydrogen that might be useful. But at any rate, the moon's a great place to get that stuff. And it's going to be a significant chunk of your total mass budget. Well, so mass is mass is good shielding. It's based off the radiation cross-section um, of something that you kind of stack between you and the source of the, the radiation. How, how likely is it for that radiation to either hit something and bounce off or to be absorbed by the material. And so uh, density plays a large role there. So hydrogen, unfortunately, we can't store very dense. It's it's not great, um, but stuff stored in the form of water uh, is potentially a good radiation shield. Right. And so you have, and I'm not gonna plug anybody specifically, but you have uh, researchers and you have organizations that have looked at you know specific architectures where they utilize water mm -hmm. as a radiation source and then electrolyze it just prior to use to get the hydrogen and oxygen that you need right. because once you do that process you know you buy into now i've got to store these cryogenically or uh, they don't become as useful to you necessarily and so um, storing fuel and oxidizer as either water or specifically as ice um, are potential options uh, that i know lots of people are looking at um, it's not deep into my research or anything you mentioned yeah. the um, uh the use of these the chemical propellants that you essentially generate uh, either on board or on the moon or whatever, hydrogen and oxygen uh, in liquid form or, or other propellants that are relatively high thrust systems. And you also mentioned the uh, uh, weakly bound orbits, the weak stability boundary uh, kind of orbits. Being in a weakly bound situation only means that your total energy is, is very close to zero. That doesn't mean that you always have to be distant from Earth. Mm -hmm. uh, you can be in a, a weakly bound orbit and do a swing by very close to Earth. You just have a very high velocity swing by. And if you're using a high thrust system, that's the best time to do that delta V is when you're deep down in a gravity well going fast, you get your most efficient energy transfer to the vehicle using that high thrust system down close there. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, definitely. And so a lot of the ways of patching together uh, low energy orbits, both in the Earth Moon system as well as in the Sun Earth uh, system, um, and so as we would interact with Mars or other planets, 
uh, a lot of the technologies for saying, okay, well, here's my uh, trajectory that's going to make use of some of these uh, dynamical points, uh, again, requires that, that point where the two things match up. And so it, it typically says, okay, we're going to have a relatively high uh, impulse or amount of thrust that occurs to, to shorten the window in which those two things need to match up. And so uh, both that and electric propulsion have very interesting ways of, of dealing with that multi-body gravity problem. I'm going to just the, jump uh, in and say, uh, I'm sorry, Tom, just you can continue in a second. Just since we only have about uh, seven or eight minutes left, uh, I just want to uh, make sure that we remember to ask any other questions or bring up other points that either of you would like to uh, raise before we're, we're done here. Go ahead. Tom. Yeah, I was yeah. just going to mention that uh, we're talking about these column exotic orbits around Lagrange points and so on. Uh, these are not things that are strictly in the realm of, well, we'll eventually get to using these things. The Genesis spacecraft uh, did a, a specific uh, version of a Lisa Zhu orbit called a halo orbit around the Earth-Sun L1 point and very successfully navigated that orbit for two and a half years and brought it mm -hmm. back. So this is not a technology that's, gee, someday we'd like to use that. No, this is something we've been doing. Yeah, uh, and it's been in the news a lot in the last, uh, well, almost exactly 12 months, uh, but the James Webb Space Telescope uh, is in an orbit uh, about the uh, Sun-Earth Lagrange point L2. So that's the one that's a little bit farther from Earth yeah. than the Sun, which has some advantages, uh, again, because that means that Earth is always in one direction, and so is the Sun. So they could put that big sun shield that you saw unfolding mm -hmm. there, block the Sun, and then Earth kind of tugs it along with it in orbit and so it can always look out into the cold uh and have the sun on the other side not you know blocking the infrared radiation that it's trying to observe so not mm -hmm. only are there benefits but as you mentioned it, it's not science fiction um, to talk about some of you know what we might call exotic orbits we call them exotic in the sense that they're not shaped like an ellipse and they might use the gravity of multiple bodies uh, yeah. but there are mm -hmm. tens and dozens of of missions that have uh, accomplished uh, a lot of this. You have uh, several missions that have used one or both of, of the Sun-Earth uh, Lagrange points. You have missions that have used um, some or both of the uh, Earth-Moon Lagrange points, uh, all that temporarily. Um, another uh, mission is you have SOHO and some other solar observatories um, at the Sun-Earth L1 point, which is the one that's closer towards the Sun, so they can always point towards the Sun and always have Earth one direction, you know, behind them so they can point their uh, uh, communication systems back home. And so um, there's definitely advantages. We've recognized those advantages since the late 70s. Um, and so we have decades of experience in dealing with multi-body systems um, and orbits that arise between them, even those that, you know, like you said, have these exotic or, or kind of low energy type behaviors and are either periodic or quasi-periodic. And I, I just need to run, jump in and say, for some of our listeners who may have gotten a little lost with this discussion of exotic orbits, these, these Lagrange point orbits, we're talking about them in the context of constructing the cyclers and then getting them on the Mars Earth trajectory, right? That they wouldn't take place as part of yeah, that. Yeah, that was, that was the question that, that Andy had raised is, are there advantages to picking other construction points um, rather than low Earth orbit? And those are pot a potential uh place where something could be constructed or where you might already have an outpost or a habitat or a station or something um, that's manufacturing things. And it's it's something that we didn't look at. Yeah, because it's easy to get to, for example, from the Earth and from the moon. Um, and so if you're sending parts from both and they kind of arrive there, um, you know, there's a lot of people that have envisioned infrastructure building up at, for example, the Earth, moon, Lagrange points. Right, sort of a natural hub for manufacturing. Fuel depots, things like that, yeah. Um, well, given that we have a few minutes left, uh, Andy, or I'll let you go first. Is there any other um, part of this uh, conversation that you want to make sure to raise? Yeah, I do. There is one thing. That, and okay. um, So um, my dad gets a lot of credit for going to the moon, and that tends to be the thing that people talk about. Um, they don't talk about things like this, and I would have to say, you know, he certainly played a role in um, developing training for under for EVAs and um, and that was important. Um, but I think and there are lots of other areas of technologies that he 
always looked at. But I have to think that in the future, um, at some point, I really do believe we will be using cyclers. And, and I think people will look back at it and say, you know, while he didn't create it on his own, he certainly popularized it a great deal and advocated it a great deal. And I think, you know, the work that he did in both of those senses, in both developing concepts and advocacy, advocating concepts, will probably probably should go down as, as maybe his greatest contribution. So yeah, that would be kind of my sign off for Mark. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for highlighting that. Yes, it was extremely important in bringing the world's attention to it and look at where we are now with so much of a rich conversation about on the best way to do it. Um, Brian, anything you want to add? No, I can just follow up on that. I know I myself have been highly inspired by um, Buzz, um, not just as, you know, an astronaut and his actions, you know, on behalf of NASA, but as a mind and as a researcher and as a scientist uh, with a well-earned doctorate himself. And, um, you know, when I talked with Buzz, you know, he was talking orbits and all this kind of stuff and got really excited and just sharp as attack and telling us everything um, about his vision for what he wanted to see. And I was absolutely inspired as much by that as by any story I've ever heard about him walking on the moon. And, you know, I had some students that sat down and, and talked with him uh, a couple of years back and they said the exact same thing that they're just inspired by the vision that he had and the way he could describe it uh, in detail. And so definitely, I think that that's a huge impact um, on a lot of people here. And as you saw in some of the papers in the last few years, uh, where people have been following up on these ideas because they've just been inspired by the vision. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for saying that. It must have been very inspiring to work with him. Um, Tom, would you, yeah, anything you'd like to add before we close? Well, just a couple of things very quickly. One, when you get people together who understand gravitational potential and the motion of objects in gravitational potential fields, we love to talk orbits. We, we get together and just have a great time, whether it's uh, at a conference room table or over a bar table having a beer or something. We love to talk orbits. Uh, a, a specific uh, extension of the cycler concept, we've been talking about Earth-Mars cyclers and, and Earth-Moon cyclers. Uh, it gets a little different when you start talking about destinations out in the outer solar system, like there's a lot of interest in Titan and there have been a lot of science fiction stories and some maybe not quite so science fiction uh, 30 or 40 or 100 years down the line of going to Titan. Uh, it's a little different problem. You can, you can do a round trip cycler to Mars in uh, two and a seventh years. Uh, Titan one way is six years. So you're talking about a minimum of 12 years for a Titan uh, cycler. Uh, it's a completely different problem because of that. And so I'm sure there would be some thoughts about how reasonable is it to think about uh, cyclers to the outer solar system. Hmm. Sounds like we need another episode to cover that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all. I think we are about out of time. I uh, just want to thank uh, professors uh, Kaplinger and Aldrin for spending their precious time with us today and talking about the great work that they've done. Clearly, there's a lot more that still needs to be done and explored, and we're, we're happy to take that forward as uh, you know, time and interest permit. And thank you for uh, the audience for, uh, for listening in and, uh, and watching this. We really appreciate your continued uh, excitement over all things space. Uh, if you have suggestions for future discussion topics or people you would like us to interview, please let us know. Send us an email at ourfutureinspace at orbitalassembly.com or finding us on Twitter at our at Our Future Space or on Facebook at, at Our Future In Space. And if you like what we're doing at Orbital Assembly and like to find other ways to support us, feel free to reach out to an email uh, to info at orbitalassembly.com. Thanks everyone for listening and uh, see you next time. This program represents the personal opinions of the hosts and their guests. The content, opinions, and views do not necessarily represent the views and opinions of Orbital Assembly nor the organizations with which any of the program participants may be affiliated. The mere appearance or promotion of this program does not constitute an endorsement by Orbital Assembly or its affiliates. Our future.
Adventure in Space. Copyright, Orbital Assembly. Hosts, Dr. Jeff Greenblatt, and they record audio and video production by Tim Alatori. Musical theme, The Last Day by Dark Blue Studio.